welcome everybody to our CEPR Sustainable Finance RPN webinar about decarbonizing large portfolios. My name's Tim Phillips. We are going to be live with you for the next 90 minutes. Uh, we're going to be discussing today how should institutional investors react to climate change risks? How do they choose to justify their strategies? What impact will their actions have? You'll get a chance to ask questions after we have two presentations. Who's going to be presenting today? Well, uh, we have with us uh, Patrick Bolton uh, for Columbia Business School, visiting at Imperial College at the moment. Dirk Schoenmacher as well from uh, Erasmus University, Rotterdam. Um, you will know both of them, I am sure, by their reputation. Um, I've been happy to have both of them as guests on the CEPR's Vox Talks economics podcast in recent times, and their episodes are well worth a listen, but don't listen to them now. Listen to them live, first of all, then go along to Vox Talks economics and listen to what they had to say to me recently. Uh, as I say, we are live. You will have the opportunity to ask questions. How do you do that? Well, there's a couple of ways you can do it. At the bottom of your screen, there is a, a question and answer QA panel. You can type your question in there and uh, it will come through to me. I will read it out. You'll get an answer for it. Uh, otherwise, you can use that little picture of a hand. Put your hand up uh, if you want to ask the question in person. And uh, if we see people with their hands up, then, of course, we will give you the chance to ask a question. We do encourage you to ask questions. Don't complain afterwards that we didn't talk about the things you were interested in. You haven't asked about it. Now, uh, first of all, uh, Patrick is going to be presenting. After that, then Dirk will have the floor for a little while. And then after that, we will have our discussion. So it's not going to be any more complicated than that. So first of all, Patrick, I'd uh, like to ask you to present your material. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, and uh, given uh, the short time we have for this important, what I believe to be a very important subject. Okay, so uh, decarbonizing large portfolios, uh, a lot of things need to be explained here. Um, what does decarbonizing mean? Uh, why a large portfolio uh, and what kind of portfolio? So I will dig into all of these things uh, and um, I will divide my talk into uh, two parts. I will give you a little bit of context and motivation to begin with, and then I will show you uh, one particular uh, way you could go about uh, decarbonizing uh, uh, a large portfolio, equity portfolio, uh, and then I will conclude. So um, in terms of uh, motivation, um, what uh, we really uh, want to keep in mind here is the, um, the risk management aspect uh, or you know, with, with respect to portfolio composition in particular, and uh, how uh, risk management uh, is relevant when we talk about risks uh, associated with climate change. And uh, risk management can mean three things concretely. Uh, one is to uh, reduce uh, your exposure to certain risks. Uh, if you think they're large, and if you think that these risks are not adequately compensated. So that's the second part uh, uh, of the risk management uh, problem for portfolio investors is that uh, you will, you, you're, you're not shying away from taking risk, but you want to be adequately compensated. And then uh, a third way in which uh, risk management uh, is relevant is that you can push your the companies you invest in to reduce the risks they create uh, by engaging with them. Uh, I will have little to say about engagement uh, uh, today, but there will be a, one small uh, uh, but important, nevertheless important engagement application uh, in, uh, that emerge, will emerge from the portfolio and decarbonization policy. Now, if we want to have a sense in which uh, 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 
a sense of the, the kinds of risks uh, uh, that uh, um, are involved. Uh, I'll, I'll come to that in, 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 in a couple of slides. Uh, before, let me just uh, emphasize the, another aspect of the, of the context where uh, that is important, and that is uh, at least two, if not more, recent initiatives uh, in the in institutional investor community uh, that um, have to do with this problem. You have, on the one hand, the UN can be asset owners, Net Zero Alliance. Uh, asset owners, if you want, are, are uh, funds like uh, NBIM, the Norwegian fund, uh, but there are plenty of other uh, uh, funds or pension funds around the world uh, that are part of this alliance. And they say they want to be net zero uh, compatible in, ter in terms of their uh, investment holdings. Question is, what does that mean? Uh, and then uh, along with the asset owners, you have the asset managers. And there you have the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative. Uh, this is something you can look up on the web. What's interesting is what they say on, the, on, on their web page. This, this initiative commits to support the goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and commits to setting interim targets for 2030 consistent with a fair share of the 50% global reduction in CO2. Okay, that's what they say. Not clear what that all means. And then, of course, you may have followed uh, also the Glasgow uh, uh, Net Zero Alliance uh, created by uh, uh, Mark Carney, which has been uh, uh, in the news recently because some of the uh, uh, institutional investors that joined have uh, decided to pull out. Um, anyway, so um, to, again, uh, more context, to give a sense of what what kind of exposure that the institutional investor community uh, has to carbon emissions, these figures are quite uh, instructive. Uh, and uh, in the interest of time, let me just focus on the all countries figure here, uh, which includes all institutional investors in all countries. And what you see there, just focus on the yellow and uh, orange plots. Those are the, the, the carbon uh, footprints of the entire community of institutional investors with respect to uh, direct emissions, scope one, and indirect emissions, scope three. So the indirect is yellow, direct emissions is orange. And the, the main takeaway here is that you can see no significant reduction, except maybe in the very uh, last year, recent years, uh, in terms of the, 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 the total amount of carbon emission exposure uh, at the institutional investors have. Um, okay, so uh, basically huge exposure and uh, this is in a context where we see a ramping up of efforts around the world in trying to uh, move in a direction of uh, reducing carbon emissions to be compatible with a, a, a net zero emissions by 2050. And here, what's really striking is how is the, the number uh, of countries that have made pledges in very recent years to decarbonize, to be net carbon neutral. So in 2018, if you looked at all the, all the governments that made commitments to be carbon neutral, that represented about 10% of CO2 emissions, global CO2 emissions. And now it's more than 70%. So in, within a very small number of years, huge ramping up of commitments, not just the number of countries making commitments, but also the strength of the commitments with many countries uh, putting their commitments into law. The UK is one of those countries, but you, you have a list here of other countries or states uh, if you, uh, in the United States. So California has very similar commitments to the UK being net, uh, carbon neutral by 2045. 
Okay, so you have these commitments by government saying that's where we're going. But you have the portfolios of institutional investors holding all this exposure to carbon emissions. So basically, what we are seeing is that uh, they're, they're, they're holding a lot of risk because if this materializes, is the, if the, if the economy-wide, global economy-wide decarbonization materializes, that's going to have implications for portfolios, uh, for the, the companies uh, uh, that uh, issue stocks and therefore for the portfolios that institutional investors hold. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, uh, I've been a co-author with, along with uh, Marcin Kakbersik, colleague here at uh, Imperial, and uh, Frederick Samana, uh, um, who form, was formerly at Amundi Asset Management and has recently joined S&P. Uh, and we have uh, proposed one particular way of uh, analyzing the problem and how and of constructing a zero carbon uh, 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 aligned portfolios. And um, so pay attention here to the second bullet, which is really very important, something that's not been well understood in the industry often and, and by some of our uh, the people who have commented on our work. And so our perspective is one of a well diversified investor who takes the world as given and aims to reduce portfolio carbon footprint to net zero by 2050. Okay, so a well-diversified investor, that's, think of the Norwegian sovereign wealth and BIM. They are well-diversified. How would they be uh, net zero aligned with their portfolio policy from now until 2050? Uh, that would be the question we're asking. So think of the Norwegian fund, and uh, and that's a large fund. It's over a trillion uh, US dollars. So now I've explained two important aspects of the problem. The large part and the objective, which is to remain well diversified as well as possible. Now, so you approach the problem you have today. Think of the Norwegian fund. They, they, they hold the whole market. Um, now, they could remain essentially passive, to a large extent, their investments are passive. They could remain passive if uh, all the companies they hold were decarbonizing and were aligned with net zero. They wouldn't have to do anything. But the problem is, as we know, as we see, is that companies are not, at, yet current, at least currently, on average, they are not net zero. Their emissions, if anything, are rising. They're not declining. And so the, the problem that a fund like Nor uh, the uh, Norway fund would face is if they want to reduce their carbon footprint so that their portfolio at, uh, by 2050 has zero net carbon weighting, uh, how do they do this if they, given that companies are not doing it themselves? And, and the answer is simple. They will have to shed stocks of companies that have very high emissions to be able to reduce their carbon footprint. And then the question becomes, well, which companies' stocks should they shed uh, in, uh, and at the same time preserve uh, good diversification? Okay, so that's the question we're asking. So in technical terms, we're looking at a way of decarbonizing the portfolio Given that the underlying stocks are not decarbonizing, the companies are not decarbonizing, uh, and uh, and we're doing this to try and minimize the tracking error uh, with respect to the uh, mark, uh, market index. And next question is, uh, at what rate do you decarbonize your portfolio? Uh, and here we, we really, uh, and, and what does it mean to be net zero aligned? So here we're really building on uh, a, a key concept uh, of the IPCC, which is the notion of a carbon budget, remaining carbon budget that we have globally. Uh, it's a shrinking carbon budget. Uh, it was uh, around 300 gigatons of CO2 in 2020. 
uh, uh, if uh, the world wants to avoid uh, um, overheating by more than 1.5 degrees centigrade with a high probability, 83% uh, probability, uh, according to the IPCC. Now, that 300 gigaton number has to be set against the flow of additional carbon emissions per year coming from human activity, economic activity. And that is estimated by the IEA to be around 31.5 gigatons of CO2. So you can see the rate at which we're eliminating this budget. By this year, 2023, the remaining budget is only 237 gigatons of CO2. And if we keep on uh, uh, emitting carbon at this rate, by the end of the decade, we will have emitted more than uh, uh, what we should have emitted to uh, remain within 1.5 uh, over overheating. So we need to reduce our emissions uh, uh, in line with the budget that's remain that we, uh, remains. That that's what we, it means to be net zero compatible. And and so how it applies to the portfolio is that the portfolio carbon footprint has to shrink at the rate at which the global carbon budget shrinks. Okay, so that's the that's the, the the decarbonization rate question answered for you. Okay, and then in terms of how do you measure the carbon uh, the portfolio carbon footprint? That's a straightforward question. You look at the weight of each stock in your portfolio. And you apply that weight to the emissions. Of the, of the company, uh, uh, and, uh, and then you just add up and you get a weighted sum of emissions, and that's your total uh, carbon footprint. You can do that either by uh, focusing on scope one, direct emission, or by focusing on scope three, uh, emissions, uh, or you can even look at both uh, together uh, um, uh, if you want. But let's keep things simple here and just think, think in terms of one or the other. Um, okay, so the redu reduction trajectory uh, represents, uh, in our first uh, scenario that we analyzed in the paper, in the article, a 8% a, a, a re uh, geometric reduction rate until 2050 uh, in the carbon footprint. Uh, 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 and, and that's uh, with an initial 25% reduction at implementation, uh, which was uh, at end of 2020 under analysis. And so that's the decarbonization rate. As I said, you to decarbonize, you have to shed companies. And then the, the idea is you shed companies, but while, while you're trying to maintain uh, sectoral uh, Allocation. So you shed companies in different sectors, trying to maintain sector weights, and we try and we impose a constraint of no more than plus uh, uh, two or minus two percent uh, deviation from sector weights of the, the current market index. Um, and okay, and when you do this, uh, you uh, um, have a policy of decarbonization that you can calculate over time how your decarbonized portfolio differs from the market index, and then you can calculate uh, tracking it. And we do this using the, uh, the, 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 the standard methodology, a multi-factor model, uh, the VARA risk model. And, and, and our working assumption, as I said, is uh, that emissions of underlying constituent companies remain constant. That's a strong assumption. Uh, if anything, emissions have been rising, but hopefully at some point you will want to see companies also reduce their emissions. And that might change the way you decarbonize at that point. But uh, the, um, the main takeaway from this analysis is that, um, sorry, I'm trying to, Yeah, so the main takeaway is that if you look at the large portfolio, one trillion euros, 
as I said, think of the Norwegian fund. Um, uh, you can decarbonize and be net zero compatible while maintaining a low uh, tracking error in, in early years. Uh, and we did the calculation with respect to the MSCI Europe. Uh, now, of course, it rises towards the end, but it's not that large. It's 1.9% in 2050. And we did it, the similar calculation for MSCI World and the MSCI Emerging Market uh, Benchmarks. Um, so here's the basic idea. So look at two companies, A and B, in the same sector. Here in this uh, example, company A, you own 5% in each company stocks. And company A, however, has 160 carbon footprint. Company B is a 40 carbon footprint. Um, that translates into a portfolio footprint of eight and two, a total of 10. Now you need to reduce that if, you, if you're going to decarbonize at a 12% rate. Uh, from year, year to year, you need to reduce that 10 to 8.8. .8. How do you do that if the companies themselves maintain their carbon footprint? Well, uh, simple. You sell a bit of company A, you only hold 4% of company A and buy a bit of company B. You, only, you now hold 6% of company B and that gets you there. Notice here you maintain perfect sectoral weighting. And, and you have to keep on doing this. Now, if in year three you're lucky and the companies themselves decarbonize, you know, now you see A goes down to 150, B goes down to 30, then you can do a passive investor. You don't have to do anything. Okay, so that's roughly the, the, the general idea. Um, now, uh, here's an illustration in the picture of the results I've already mentioned, uh, you can see on the left-hand picture that the budget of the portfolio, so the total budget for the world is 300. That translates into a budget for the portfolio of around 30. And that has to shrink uh, uh, at the rate as we explained. Uh, and that means that the only get shaded end is what you can spend in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, and uh, the point, uh, the key point here is what's highlighted on the results is that you have a low tracking error, 0, uh, 0 0.08, 0 0.08% in 2021, rising to 1.9% in 2050. Um, and, Okay, so, so that was a key result I wanted to highlight. So uh, let me repeat again before I get to the next, uh, so, to this slide. You're a large portfolio. You're, you're the so Norwegian sovereign wealth fund. You want to be net zero compatible. So you shrink your carbon footprint. That means you shed companies in, that have high emissions. Well, you can do this sector by sector, gradually by shedding the companies that have the highest emissions, other things equal. So now you have a less and less diversified portfolio over time, but it still remains largely that well diversified. You still have low tracking there. Okay, so now another thing uh, you might uh, have to consider is what if you postpone the decarbonization? What if, what if you, instead of starting 2023, you only start in 2024, or 2025? This is a very concrete question that uh, portfolio managers face today. What if I just wait and deal with this later? Well, here's the big point. If you wait, you have to decarbonize at a higher rate later. And that is a big problem because if you really, if you have to decarbonize at a very high rate, that is going to have huge effects on uh, your tracking error. And, and, and then obviously if you wait too long, it, it, uh, uh, you won't be able to be compatible anymore with net zero. Okay, and so now uh, a point about engagement, which is very interesting that comes out of this analysis. As, I, as I've said multiple times, you have to shed companies uh, that are, are higher emitters 
over time. Well, what's interesting is you, you can, you can, based on the simulation, you can determine which companies go out first and when, and which companies go out later uh, and when. Here is a, is an exit uh, roadmap uh, for the MSCI Euro portfolio. Uh, uh, and you can see, you can recognize some big companies here. So uh, like Amy, the Italian uh, fossil fuel company will be dropped from the portfolio in 2023 if they don't do anything in terms of their decarbonization. EP would be dropped in 2030. A shell in 2035. Uh, okay, this is just for energy companies. You can do that for every sector. So why is that important? Well, because you can tell the companies, when you engage with companies, you can tell, please decarbonize. If you don't decarbonize, we will drop you at this date. So this is, has a sort of strong incentive effect, uh, which we think is a good property of this uh, approach. Okay, so now uh, I, I will quickly sum up and then uh, pass the microphone to Dirk. But before I sum up, I just want to point out that uh, this is something that has now been offered as a product by S&P. Uh, S&P on September 8, 2020, last year, introduced a new battery of indices, the S&P Dow Jones uh, uh, Net Zero 2050 uh, carbon budget indices, uh, and they are constructed very in a very similar way to what I've illustrated. It's a, some uh, somewhat different assumptions, somewhat different uh, 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 targets, uh, but it's basically what I what I've uh, described. And what's interesting is that they are implementing what's called a vintage index policy which has to do with the fact that uh, the, the decarbonization policy will be different if you start 2023, as opposed to if you start in 2024 or 2025 and so on. And let me here quote uh, what the president of S&P Global Sustainable One said about these, uh, these new indices. Uh, it is essential that investors have access to simple, transparent and scalable tools to support their decision making. And we are proud to be launching this new series of indices to support investors in navigating the transition to a sustainable future. So the point here is uh, he's making is that this is a service that S&P provides to passive investors, allowing them in a very simple way to be net zero aligned just by choosing to hold one of these uh, carbon budget indices. Okay. And uh, uh, they did this for uh, various uh, uh, market indices around the world, the S&P 500, uh, the uh, S&P Global BMI, uh, uh, et cetera, emerging uh, BMI. And here you have a, a list of all these uh, indices. Uh, so, but uh, let me not uh, uh, spend too much time here. and Let me wrap up now. And what, what I want to say again is that climate finance uh, is a risk management problem. One way to manage your risk with respect to carbon emissions and, and the carbon transition risk is to have a portfolio that is decarbonizing in line with net zero targets. That puts you on a path that's consistent with all the commitments that governments have made. Uh, and therefore uh, reduces uh, your risk with respect to uh, uh, carbon transition risk. And uh, the, the important point that emerges from our analysis, uh, I, I can't emphasize that enough, is that time is a risk factor in itself. So it matters when you start doing this and you have to change your strategy if you delay your decarbonization. And so, uh, to conclude, uh, uh, let me say that good risk management when it comes to climate transition risk means aligning portfolios with net zero goals. That seems obvious, hopefully, after my presentation, but not so obvious in you know, uh, a priori or in the current debate. With that, with that, let me stop sharing my slides and pass the microphone to Dermot. Thank you very much, uh, 
Patrick. Um, there is uh, one question that I think is good to to clarify with you now, and uh, that someone's asking: what what emission scope are you using in your analysis? Is it one, two, three, or the sum? Uh, so we do different uh, uh, specifications. Uh, we use uh, scope one as one specification, scope mm -hmm. three as another specification, and the sum. The problem with the sum is you, it's a bit of double counting. Uh, so, yeah. But yeah. we do. I mean, from your point of view, what is the most satisfactory strategy to be pursuing? Well, I guess now when we're in the early days, still in the early days of man of measuring this appropriately and, uh, and, and ultimately as we get further down the net zero track. Yeah, so uh, the, 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 the way I would answer this question is that some sectors like the energy sector, the most important measure is scope three, downstream scope three. So you definitely want to have that downstream scope three. In other sectors, scope three is not that big deal. So you definitely want to have scope one. And so ideally you want to sort of modulate how much you use scope one or scope three, depending on which sector you're looking at. Okay. Patrick, thank you very much. I'd like to hand over to uh, Dirk now. I should also point out that Dirk is the uh, leader of the RPN that is presenting uh, this webinar today. And uh, he's going to uh, give his presentation. Afterwards, we have some discussion, got some more questions coming in already. Keep those questions coming in. And we will try and get through all of them. So to do that, though, first of all, I'll hand over to Dirk. Dirk, you're on. Thank you, uh, Tim. And also thank you, uh, Patrick, for kicking off. And I think uh, I think Patrick, Patrick nicely shows what investors can do. They can really uh, reduce uh, their exposure, the risk management perspective. And I think a key message, uh, a key assumption, uh, Patrick, was to take the world as given. And what I would like to do, I will take the next step. Uh, what can we do in addition? So the question is, uh, is it exogenous? Yeah, that's how you take the world as given and as investor we react, or can we, uh, uh, is the process endogenous? And I will uh, come to that in a minute. And secondly, uh, what is the role of the players? Um, of course, the government is the first mover, uh, setting the carbon tax and, and other policies, institutional investors, companies, um, and uh, the real sweet spot is, if they align and, uh, and, and cooperate, not as substitutes, but really as complementary to each other to get the greatest uh, effect. And I will show you uh, a few examples. But my main message today is uh, try, uh, so I, I, because the second main message I think from, um, from Patrick was uh, time is of the urgency. The first report we did at the European uh, Systemic Risk Board in uh, about five to seven years ago, economists were not really interested because, well, we know the answer carbon tax. And only uh, when we put the notion in, uh, well, but uh, the speed uh, is important, then the title of the report was too late, too sudden. So if we wait too long, we will we will get stronger policies from government. And I think that was the, the slide of uh, Patrick, that if you move later, uh, the drops will be uh, more uh, steep. And I've been a policymaker for 10 years. That means regulation, uh, because economists can only think about uh, carbon taxes. But at some point, like the Montreal Protocol on CFCs, we just get regulation from the covenant and telling some sectors no carbon for you anymore. So the, the longer uh, we wait, will the drop, the, the tougher, uh, the taxes, but also the regulations will be. Um, so the quicker we move, uh, the more we have it in our own hands. Okay, this is um, a bit from uh, different science. Um, at the Rotterdam School of Management, we have different uh, de uh, departments and one department on transition management. 
So this is from my colleague, uh, Dirk Lorbach. And basically uh, they say um, uh, transitions are an, uh, an, an shockwise uh, process. So at the top, you get uh, optimization uh, of the current way of working. You get destabilization, disruption, and then, um, well, basically chaos. Uh, and at the bottom, you get the new um, ways of experimenting. And then at the end, uh, you get chaos. And uh, this is taken from sociology. So they, they stress that the world is not deterministic. So what will come out of this chaos is unclear. Uh, so we can only uh, uh, envisage what can happen, but it is not uh, that there is a certain uh, thing you can, uh, if you feel that you can just sign up for that and you're ready. So, because it is a social and societal process, this, uh, this disruption. Um, and basically for our case, uh, we start from high carbon, um, then we get new ventures, uh, and then the end game is net zero, uh, what Patrick introduced, and fossil fuels are phased out. And um, I like the approach of Patrick because he said, well, we, we take a sectoral approach, so we don't deviate more than 2%. And basically, um, this transition thinking, you should apply at sector level. Uh, rather than at the economy as a whole, what we typically do with big integrated assessment models, what happens with uh, the macro economy, I think it is more useful what is happening in certain sectors, like biodiversity uh, is extremely important for mining and agriculture, while um, energy transition is important for the oil companies and uh, carbon intensive uh, manufacturing and transport. So we have different uh, transitions in different sectors. Okay, if we go a step further, um, what we typically do, uh, and for example, in finance, is uh, we like equilibrium models. I like the capital asset pricing model, it's a big equilibrium model. Everybody has the market portfolio um, according to the theoretical derivation. And what you then sometimes get a little bit in the papers is, okay, um, if there are preferences for ESG uh, stocks, then the price is bid up and an equilibrium model, uh, it has to come down. So today, a higher return and tomorrow, a lower return. The good news is we slowly get the insight that transition risk, as also described by, by Patrick, is seen as a systematic form of risk, which you cannot diversify away from. It's still more or less uh, considered to be uh, coming from the outside. And my picture in the previous uh, slide is really to um, encourage you to see it uh, as structural change. Uh, you go from one state, high carbon, to really completely new state. Some of the old plays will be there, but many not anymore. So you really get to a new type equilibrium and then the key point is uh, so the the outcome and the solutions depend on the actors uh, on the action of the key players in the system government investors and um, uh, uh, and companies so it is endogenous uh, so in our collective action um, we uh, we uh, we we co-determine uh, the the future, especially like very big player, uh, the Norwegian pension fund was mentioned, uh, BlackRock others. So their actions matter. Uh, and a nice example of a system approach is, uh, I think all three of us here are old enough to remember that the ozone layer was uh, the big issue when we were young, uh, had um, ultra uh, uh, red was coming through and then uh, no taxation, but just a regulatory ban by the key countries on these chlorofluorocarbons, just a, a regulatory ban by the key countries and the countries who would not play the game, they would get trade sanctions. In the end, they were not needed in three to five year times uh, CFCs were stopped and the ozone layer has now been uh, uh, it's greatly restored and my message from um, 
Patrick's discussion of the time factor, the longer we wait, and let's be honest, the current uh, data are still on uh, business as usual. If you look at emissions, we decrease a little bit, but then we do uh, artificial intelligence and other things, in, uh, which is an increase. So we are net uh, uh, horizontal. We get stronger um, uh, uh, measures in the future, including regulatory bands. Uh, so, uh, and then in finance terms, so if, for example, um, a certain type um, like cement, uh, which is very uh, carbon intensive, will be forbidden, we will only do construction by wood, by timber, then that means your shares in Heidelberg cement will be overnight zero. Uh, because finance is extremely good at anticipating. So once the, uh, the European and then Asian and US government announce no cement, the, the stocks in all these countries, even if they say it will happen in 10 years time, uh, we will face it out today. Uh, the stock value of these companies will be close to zero, stranded assets. Okay, my argument for a systems approach so uh, what do we take in budget uh, and uh, well explained by, by Patrick. Um, I just mentioned a few uh, high carbon sectors. So the supply side, transport, manufacturing, but also if you be forgetted too often, real estate, uh, heating and cooling is taking a lot of our uh, carbon. Uh, and so we don't only make new real estate. So um, improving current real estate is a big investment uh, job to do for uh, institutional investors. So let's start with the government. And I borrowed this a bit from uh, Mariana Masucato. She talks about shaping markets. And, uh, and let's take the current market for hydrogen. Huh? That's a possibility of, re uh, of a major renewable. And for example, Shell is planning a hydrogen uh, factory in Punis, which is next to Rotterdam. Um, okay, so let's say uh, the plants are there. It has been endorsed, so they're building. But then we have our steel factory somewhere else in the Netherlands. So we need a pipeline from Rotterdam to Eimuiden, uh, to Tata Steel, to bring the hydrogen. Well, Tata Steel is not going to build uh, that pipeline. So we need the government to organize that. Hey, the, the, the role of government is not only subsidy, uh, tax and regulation, but also um, being the coordinator uh, to make things happen. Sometimes they take an initial investment and then the institutional investors can be co-investors. And that's basically, um, if we go back to uh, my slide, at the bottom, these new ventures and the market shaping, uh, lots of risk. Yes, lots of risk because we don't know what the outcome is. The government takes some type of lead. You see some private initiatives and then institutional investors can step in, financing them often in venture capital fund, PE, private equity type of structures because it's very risky, like two out of 10 will survive. So you cannot take them on directly. You put them in fund structures to, to diversify. So it's basically the bottom line uh, where institution investors can co-invest to, um, to make the new things happening, the new technologies, uh, which are very small at the start, uh, infrastructure, uh, the real estate uh, uh, improvement, so that's role number one, a co-investor. And the second one is, as investor directly, uh, let's take uh, roughly speaking three types of companies. So you have the green ones, uh, the gray ones that are prepared to change, and the gray ones that don't want to change. So the last one uh, you would stay uh, away from because if they don't want to change, they will become a stranded asset. And the second thing is where you could do the engagement to speed up because a real engagement is a two-way dialogue. Uh, so the investor talks with the company, 
the company explains to the investor what they are doing. And um, if you manage to improve your business model, you're basically future-proofing your business model, which means the investment uh, uh, value increases. So that's the benefit for the investor. He gets uh, a return for all his efforts because it is time consuming. And the company uh, has improved its strategy and uh, future-proofed its business model. Let's like Kodak, who didn't do it. Uh, they stayed too long, uh, you go out. And I will show you a little bit how we can uh, see this happening in practice. And it's basically engagement. And, uh, and the honest answer is that the track record on engagement is still mixed. There is lots of engagement and lots of companies are not moving very fast. So that's the, the honest answer. Um, so let's take an example of the oil sector. Uh, Patrick and I always get the questions, how can we really see whether a company is in transition? Uh, because today's performance is what happened today. But CAPEX capital expenditure is a great way of looking at the future. Uh, Nick Stern is always saying, if you invest today, you lock in your energy mix for the next 20 years. It is all long-term uh, facilities, infrastructure. So issue CAPEX still 80, 90% in fossil, like BP and Shell, or are you preparing in the future? Yes, we remain our current business, but we are investing in the future. Uh, Total Energies is an example of that. They have about uh, 50 in the re new renewables and 50 in, in the current portfolio. And some, um, like uh, Lund from uh, Sweden, they are fully switching uh, to renewables. So you can see these three types of companies. And uh, you can vote on resolutions. Follow this is very active on that. And uh, some pension funds are really uh, endorsing them. The tragedy is the more uh, large investors divest from the company because they don't move, the less votes you get uh, on the on the annual uh, uh, general meeting. So that's a bit of pity. So the more you divest, the less uh, you can use the voting mechanism. And engagement, uh, Elroy Dimson did great work on uh, the, the action of coordinated large investors working together. And a new way of engagement is with smart targets, uh, like the 8% reduction per year, which, which uh, Patrick mentioned. That is what we more or less need to get to the net zero. You can put it down as targets and put that in the discussion with the oil companies and then you can look whether they are coming close to the 8% rather than only having a discussion. So you set targets what you want to see. And as I said, the honest answer is it is mixed success. So some are listening and some are uh, not yet really moving. And now a second to, uh, to trigger a bit your imagination uh, on the... Horizontal axis is the timeline, as we said, uh, that's crucial. On the vertical axis is the demand for the new sustainable product. And uh, I took the example of the car market, electric cars. So 10 years ago, it was very unclear what would happen there. There was no substitute. Uh, electric cars were a novelty. Uh, by now, 2020, 2023, it is quite clear that the electric cars will be the dominating model a substitute for uh, combustion cars. And now you can see the transition curve. Tesla is uh, ahead of the game, so they uh, only make electric cars, so they uh, can fully serve the demand. And let's see where the others are. So in 2030, the, the, the uh, demand for combustion cars will be zero because uh, uh, everybody will buy electric cars. So let's put Volkswagen. Hey, they are very busy with the ID program, uh, two, three, four, five. Um, so they're catching up. I put them at 40% of uh, Tesla, still quite a lot of uh, combustion uh, 
And what are the value implications? So we are investors. So first, the, 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 the blue line at the top is the, uh, the industry transition curve. Green Tesla is quite close. And the dotted blue one is the industry um, uh, benchmark or average. Okay. So if you are a car maker, you are a bit behind on the red line. You could do a big investment to get to the yellow line, to get up. And, and remember in March, uh, Volkswagen announced a uh, close to $200 billion uh, investment program to speed up uh, the car plants with the retraining of the workers. So that's an example of from red to yellow that you do a major investment. And what are the value implications of these lines? Remember, the blue dotted line is the benchmark, that's the average. So Tesla is clearly uh, doing better because they are serving the new market. The, the, the traditional car making with the red line is behind. And by doing a catch-up investment and being successful, that's an open question. Um, uh, and traditional car making can catch up. So if you don't move in time, you see uh, like in this model of 40% decline in value. And this is basically what happened to Kodak. And we moved to digital uh, photography. Uh, Kodak stayed with uh, the print photographs and the red line basically moved down and they uh, went bankrupt. So they didn't substitute uh, their production portfolio in time. And this way of thinking is interesting for uh, fundamental investors who uh, in certain sectors check the companies. Uh, for example, fast fashion, and the trend in fast fashion is towards uh, 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 proper uh, worker conditions, meaning a living wage for the people in, in Asia. Only Patagonia and a few small labels do it. The big labels are still uh, not doing it. But at some point, the due diligence director from Europe is coming up. It will be required. And then hey, if you take Inditex, H&M, Benetton, the one who moves in time can keep its value. The one who's not moving at all might become uh, the red one. So as an investor, you can check and discuss with the companies are you uh, really improving to the new world? Are you future-proofing your business model? So, and let's face it, uh, we are finance guys, uh, but uh, the companies are the prime movers. Uh, they are creating the externalities and they can make the new business models. Finance people cannot do that. So the, the, the companies, uh, they are the creators of value. And... Investors can support them in the dialogue uh, with engagement. And if they make major investments, uh, buying their bonds and uh, newly issued equity, if they need that for external financing. Uh, so investors can support them. Uh, and this is also a plea for uh, fundamental uh, equity valuation that you really look what the companies in your portfolio are doing. So you can see whether they are in line or ahead um, of the transition or whether they are really uh, behind and then have a dialogue and in the end, like Patrick showed, uh, divest. Uh, finishing, transition requires a systems approach at sector level. Government uh, has not only regulation role, but also uh, can help the transition to speed up. The working together, the cooperation is the, the sweet spot uh, and we can speed it up. And um, I think the joint message from Patrick and me is time and over time we will get more events. We are already seeing them will increasingly highlight the need for transition and we will make the policies uh, bolder. And, uh, and we as investors 
we've learned that we should anticipate this type of things happening uh, today so we are not caught out at the wrong corner uh, at the stranded assets corner of our portfolio thank you well thank you very much uh, Dirk. um i just like to uh ask uh, patrick now to re respond to what uh, dirk has said there and uh what you think of that and your opinions on that he takes a slightly different point of view to uh to you in how he presents this problem and a possible solution to it patrick uh, yeah, thank you, Tim, and thanks, Dirk, uh, uh, for uh, this analysis. Um, the, it's, it's hard uh, not to agree with your analysis. Um, the transition uh, that we, in, a, in our portfolio analysis, treat as exogenous or, or what's going to happen uh, to what companies do in their relation, we treat that as exogenous. That's um, uh, really, it's hard to do anything else because even the Norwegian fund that you, you, know, you pointed out, is a large fund, one of the largest funds in the world. They can barely move the needle. Uh, so they have to take, and they, in fact, their entire investment philosophy is we have to take markets as given and the world out there is given. We cannot build an investment policy on the idea that we are able to change the world with, uh, with our investment decision. Their presumption is we, as investors, have very little impact in, uh, uh, in, in our ability to change the world. And, um, you know, you mentioned co-investment in in uh, infrastructure, uh, the example you gave from the Netherlands. Now, the Norwegian fund has, I think, 0.1% of its portfolio, not more than that, invested in infrastructure. All right? And it has not more than 95% of its portfolio in listed stocks, stocks and bonds. I mean, it's in a bond. They have a tiny, fraction in unlisted space. So, uh, you know, that's the reality. That's just the reality. Now, what's interesting is that in Norway, there's a big debate going on. This is going in parliament. Should the Norwegian fund, you know, change its, 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 uh, its investment policy? And even, you know, is Norway, Nor the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund actually net zero aligned? Right? And currently, that's just a debate. Currently, the fund is not, has no intention to be net zero. It's, it's, it's philosophy is still, no, we, we are a passive investor. We can't change the world. Markets are efficient. So we hold the market. But, you know, our analysis was in a way, to, you know, uh, directed to that argument by saying, yeah, maybe that's true. But if you were to decarbonize, you would still have low tracking error and you'd still be well diversified. And actually, uh, given the analysis that you've made Dirk, in terms of the endogeneity of the problem and the potential large disruptions we're facing, you would rather want to be decarbonized than uh, not decarbonized. That's, a, that's sort of how we're thinking. Now, we've had, we've had uh, comments on this question that we're looking at a partial, we're doing a partial equilibrium analysis, which is a fair point, and that really we should be doing general equilibrium analysis, something that you refer to. And uh, the, um, and so as I said, the starting point when nobody does any decarbonization is you have to do partial equilibrium because you know, when you begin, you don't have any impact, right? And so, but then over time, as you hope, as more, Institutional investors do this. You hope there will be impact eventually, right? Prices will respond, and then when stock prices and then stock prices respond, hopefully companies will respond. Now, what's interesting is if you ask them the question, well, how will prices respond if institutional investors start building portfolio policies that are net zero aligned? How will prices respond? Well, exactly as you mentioned, Derek, in your analysis. 
the companies that have priced uh, carbon emission will see their stock price decline. Those are could be you know a stranded asset company as you analyze the companies that see their uh, emission that make an effort to be decarbonize themselves. They will see more interest from investors. They will see their stock price go up. And if you factor that in, then it's even more attractive to be the zero line to you know be ahead of that market response. So that should be an even additional argument to do what we say. Now, the last, maybe the last comment I made on, on what you ended up with on engagement, you said, yeah, the reality is, you know, we have to acknowledge that engagement isn't really working. That's definitely true. I mean, look at what happened with Exxon, for example, just recently, uh, and look at what happened with Berkshire Hathaway, a number of shareholder resolutions. Uh, you know, saying that Berkshire should do more on climate, should disclose more, I mean, Shell should do more, the BP should do more. All of this got defeated. These the companies have just shrunk it off. Uh, so, so, you know, engagement is still a uh, work in progress, let's put it this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a work in progress. Now, I just uh, want to mention to anyone who wants to ask a question. Yeah, can, a I, can I have in. a reaction? Oh, yes, Dirk. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, you... you, you... Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, I think we fully agree um, that for your, uh, for your uh, stock and bond portfolio, the decarbonization either way is a smart uh, strategy to avoid the, uh, uh, the stranded asset. And you can do it either by fundamental cho choosing or you can do it by uh, uh, the approach you propose. But that you decarbonize your uh, public traded portfolio, that's the, the obvious uh, strategy. Um, not all investors are equal. Uh, I know that uh, the Norwegians are very much on, uh, because they are so big, they are fully on uh, public assets. Uh, the big pension funds in the Netherlands, uh, ABP and the pension fund for the healthcare, uh, together almost uh, just below 1 trillion, but close to together, they put 30% uh, in private assets. Uh, they have infrastructure teams, they have real estate teams. Uh, they really do uh, all these, uh, they look for these assets of course, for return, but also they now take impact into account and a uh, large private equity uh, portfolio where they can also put these ventures in. So they put 30% in uh, private assets. And uh, so in practice, uh, they do it. And that gives a nice diversification because you diversify what you're listed. And the moving the needle, that's, uh, I think, the, the key point where we probably disagree on, but put it differently, if all of us, so if companies, if consumers who buy uh, sustainable or unsustainable products and investors are all saying, we cannot move the needle and implicitly we're saying, okay, it's up to the government. And then the government says uh, the voters are, are not yet ready for it. I call that uh, the big waiting game. And that's really a pity. Uh, and you may be able to move the needle to a certain extent. So let's not overdo it. But to say it is completely, uh, you, you are a price taker. Uh, I think we underestimate the power of large investors. Uh, that would be a pity. Yeah, let me just comment on that. That is a very important point that you just made, uh, Derek. Um, so I think what our analysis is saying is that even when you don't move the needle or assume you cannot move the needle, you can be net zero compatible and that may be in your interest. Okay? So even if you play that, what you say, that waiting game, let's say actually no, uh, it's in your self-interest not to play the self-waiting game, start decarbonizing, almost no tracking error consequence. And you never know, maybe things will be for the worse someday, and then you'll be congratulating yourself that you have a decarbonized portfolio. So the beauty of that is that 
there's no excuse anymore not to do, not to move. Now, if everyone then says, okay, we'll do it, collectively, we massively move the needle. Exactly. Yeah. Just imagine if all the investors Fully agree. did this. If, you know, 30% of the market, even 30% of the passive market did this, there would be huge impact. Yeah, agree. Yeah, and so that's sort of where we're hoping to go. That's the yeah. idea. That's really good. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Now, I, I just want to mention to anyone who does want to ask a question, you can type it into the little Q&A box, which is, I think, about down there. Or you can raise your hand. I'm going to do this. And as you see, my hand is now raised there. And um, it comes up in a, you know, we can see that and we can come to you. And then you get to ask the question yourself if you want to do that. I'm going to lower my hand. And uh, so... Please feel free to do that uh, from a couple of questions that are, are in. And I, I just want to con, you know, just confirm on this because uh, Mohammed Bakush was uh, asking this earlier. At the moment, without engagement and without a change in company strategy, just to be plain, any uh, change in portfolio structure is not a change in carbon emissions. Uh, is it, Patrick? Yeah, it, uh, it's it's correct. It's uh, it's a, it's a change in the carbon emission exposure. Exposure in, in that portfolio. Your but person, because there's a your, buyer on the other end. Your personal portfolio will be yeah. less exposed to yeah. carbon transition risk. That's the idea. So yeah. yeah, you're not changing the world. This is not a the question. The question is not. Are you going to change the world? The question is, what are you going to do as an investor, especially institutional investor? Do you have fiduciary duties to your clients, uh, to your, you know, uh, if you're, if you're uh, a sovereign wealth fund, you have fiduciary duties to your citizens. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, what are you going to do about these huge transition risks? How are you going to uh, uh, reduce that risk? Uh, so that's the, that's the question. It's not how you want to eliminate carbon emission. That would be an entirely different problem to uh, to analyze. Yeah. But it, but if I get it correct, what what you're saying is that sort of uh, the year one to year two, then you change the composition of the portfolio, and you're saying if there are enough investors with this strategy that change year two to year three, where it's noticed that helps to drive that change in strategy. That becomes one part of the yeah. incentive to change strategy, which um, is that year two to year three in your diagram. Yeah, that's right. So you can you can read that diagram that way. Uh, definitely, if if uh, you know if you have, um, let's say, so it's hard to imagine that because we've gone through the uh, Ukraine war, but you could imagine that we we didn't have the Ukraine war and we came out of COVID. So COVID was really bad for oil majors. You know, for, we forget that. The, oil, oil, uh, the, the valuation of oil majors went really down massively. And they worried about it. You know, if they've had double that uh, uh, reduction in value, everyone would be scrambling. All their shareholders would be saying, my God, what are you doing? You know, I, uh, 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 your, your valuation is way too low. You've got to do something. There would be action. That would be a very strong incentive to act. Right. Thank you very much. We have a, a, a question from um, Peter uh, about your, the X diagram in uh, Dirk's slide. And, you know, I, I think we can say that other social sciences have some really good diagrams sometimes. I really like that X diagram. But he's, uh, he's saying now that as smart investors want to be early in spotting depreciating assets and early in investing in potential solutions, then cautious and passive investors, and we've been talking a lot about passive investors today, uh, are, are, are going to miss out on both counts. It's it's doubly bad for them. Is, is that what we can take from that diagram, Dirk? Exactly. And uh, I'm a big uh, f uh, fan of, uh, to do it science-based, uh, at the London School of Economics, uh, you have the Trans Transitions Pathway Initiative, uh, financed by the industry, 
And what they do is they take a sectoral approach, like, uh, for example, the oil industry, uh, the car industry, uh, steel, airlines, and they look at the current performance of, an, uh, of an, each company and they look at the management. And, and, and that's really interesting. So 50% of the score comes from management. So are they aware of the issues? Are, uh, the, are they unaware that is the, the worst? And the best is that you fully put the transition issue in your strategy. And so that is part of your approach as company that you get the highest score. And that gives really, and then they make transition pathway initiatives, uh, uh, pathways a bit like the curves of, uh, of Patrick had that you, call, you know to net zero, what is the pathway? And then you can plot certain companies are uh, within uh, the transition curve for their sector or they are far behind. And that's an, uh, what investors are using to discuss with the companies, say, hey guys, uh, from this independent analysis, I see that you are behind. Either you speed up or I die fast. So you, because you need an objective uh, way of talking to each other. Otherwise you get just accusations mm -hmm. and you get further polarization. And what I like of that approach is um, the forward-looking management perspective, uh, what they take into account. So that's for the incumbents, because it's basically they're uh, checking the big companies and the sectors and uh, spotting uh, the new ventures. Yeah, the, the honest answer is that's an, an, an very difficult. We as academics are very bad at it. Big investors who are basically bureaucracies are very bad at it. So you, you have these specialized funds who do it. Um, they ask also high fees for it. Mm -hmm. And they have different track records. So that's the difficult part, uh, these new ventures. But uh, assessing the existing players, that's now uh, more and more done in a forward-looking manner. Mm -hmm. So today's performance and forward-looking indicators. And that's uh, quite exciting. But it, that requires an active approach. And then you can use it in Patrick's way that the ones who are ahead, you keep in the portfolio and the ones who are behind, you die fast. So we would still follow the strategy uh, that you move your portfolio to net zero. Now, you did mention that um, engagement has a mixed record. And I think that's been quite kind on engagement, isn't it? Is, is, are there particular episodes of engagement that you would pull out to say this is pointing a path to the future or do we have to wait until the engagement has more potential weight of divestment behind it it's it is a mixed record um my co-author uh, willem schermade uh, used to be an investor at uh, and at medium-sized companies uh, it's easier uh, to talk to the management and he had two-way uh, dialogues that you can also ask the companies to report in a different way. There is academic papers on if you put more long-term uh, targets and indicators in your annual report, you attract a different type of investors, the long-term investors who are looking for that information. So, uh, so you can suggest to the companies uh, that they, what you think as investor is important, draw that out more. And the company can tell you, uh, well, this is how we see uh, our sector moving. So you learn from each other. But in practice, like the engagement with the big uh, oil companies, there it is almost talking to uh, 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 deaf ears. That, that's <laughs> yeah. quite challenging. Yeah, Patrick, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that sounds right uh, to me. Um, um, you could blame the companies um, for not doing enough. Let's say oil majors, energy companies, airlines, uh, shipping companies, mining companies, cement companies. But you could also blame the investors in those companies for not doing enough. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, they, you know, maybe they need to raise their voice a bit more. Uh, 
be a bit louder in their criticisms. Uh, it's the the you know, criticism has been very subdued so far, uh, and and uh, you know voice even with a louder voice uh, you may not be uh, able to change things too much, and if you're not, there has to be a threat that will actually make a difference to these companies, and what can that threat be except to say we are no longer going to invest in your company. And that threat should be made much more loud and clear and credible by the investors who say they want to engage. You have many US, large US pension funds who say that's our policy. We want to engage. We want to change how companies do their business by engaging with them. They never raise their voice. They never threaten to leave if the company does not uh, do what they want it to do. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the frustration in, 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 in this discussion. It's, uh, it's, yeah, we wish we could do stuff with uh, engagement, but if you really believe in engagement, then take it seriously, do it seriously. And that's what I would say you know, come up, comes out of this, of this discussion. That it might be interesting because um, in the old world uh, we have it. Um, uh, Patrick and I were both in London, uh, and if your company is mentioned twice in the Financial Times, it basically means uh, the CEO will be fired. Uh, that's the mechanism. The investors start to talk; they talk to the newspaper. So, if a big company, the CEO is mentioned twice. Nine out of ten times, the CEO is removed within half a year, and that's and investors know that and use that mechanism. So, if we get that type of behavior, which we don't have yet, on environmental and social issues, uh, if that becomes the norm, that uh, if in a certain disciplined way um, you're mentioned as company uh, or the board of a company, uh, if we get the same mechanism, so the, the mechanism is available for current boards which are underperforming in the eyes of investors and then this campaign by mentioning it to the ft and they have probably scrutiny what they publish and not publish then um so if we would get and we are not yet there if we would get the same on this type of issues hey it's not the ceo but the company has no future proof strategy uh, that that's interesting so I see engagement as an evolving uh, issue. And the more we get the events at the timeline of Patrick, then it becomes more obvious that the, we have front runners and we have laggards. That will become more, more transparent. Now, I have a question that came in here, and you did mention social as well. Joshua it was uh, uh, talking, uh, mentioned that very often the cost of transitioning to low carbon is passed on to the consumer. Now, if you're talking about in, uh, investor pressure on this, can they possibly get involved and have any traction on the, ex the precise strategies with which these uh, companies go through this transition and whether or not that social part of it, the consumer be, uh, has to pick it up or should they not even really be caring about that? It's basically um, Nick Robbins at the LSE is doing a lot of work on it. This the issue of a just transition. Yes, I, I think um, here is really a role for um, for government because uh, Oxfam has done great work on the distribution of incomes and the distribution of carbon emissions. And you don't see a difference. So uh, higher income people have a higher carbon because they fly more, have bigger cars, bigger houses to heat and buy more. So it's really about redistribution, the old fashioned uh, capitalist uh, challenge for governments. So that's really uh, for governments. Uh, what companies can do, for example, uh, uh, with, with, with COVID, if you are a pharma company and you've made a new vaccine, and you've sold it at profit uh, in the US and in Europe, nobody uh, will blame you 
if you put it at cost price out in Africa, still some, some companies don't do that. So that kind of thing you can do. But redistribution itself is really uh, a government task, an extremely important one. Huh? We know the yellow vests in, uh, in, in France. Uh, the obvious thing, put the carbon tax on uh, petrol up. And if you don't do redistribution policy, it backfires. Patrick, I've got a question for you here. You mentioned um, that uh, some of some government commitment to net zero is now being put into law in some places. Others, there's a, a strong government commitment. But uh, Yubov uh, Klapkiv is asking, um, what sort of appropriate framework, government framework, uh, regulatory framework should be in place to go alongside this. We have mentioned a couple of times that these are complementary. Do we wait until later? Do we put it in now, maybe to guide investment? Yeah, uh, thanks for this question. Yeah, so um, the, sh the immediate answer is to say we need to translate these net zero targets, which are typically 2050, into year-by-year -year targets, if we really want to be serious. And then we have to be very concrete in how we're going to reduce emissions year-by-year. Year. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's a much, uh, much more straightforward uh, practical problem in saying how are we going to reduce our emissions from 2035 to 2036, you know, as far into the future, 10 years, God knows the world might have changed a lot. But how are we going to reduce our emissions by, let's say, you know, even a moderate amount, 3%, 5% from 2023 to 2024? How are we going to do it in the UK? That's a very concrete, practical question. Mm. That's a question that should have an answer. Otherwise, the government is not serious in its commitment. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, where do you cut? How do you cut? How do you replace your energy use, you know, that emits a lot with some other renewable energy use? How do you do this? How are you going to do this concretely? Uh, and, and yeah, that's what, that's what we need. Now, of course, uh, you can't say with a hundred percent that you 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 are in control because of things like what Dirk mentioned. There may be new entrants, new technology, uh, demand may change. There may be sectoral changes. Those are very you know, harder to predict. Uh, but year by year, you know, we can pretty uh, you know forecasters are very good at forecasting next year you know, pretty accurately. So we should take that as a lesson. Well, we can forecast very accurately how we should and how we can reduce our emissions, you know, from one year to the next. Do you have an opinion on what the appropriate government policy, regulatory policy should be to help guide investment? Yeah, uh, so, oh, good, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it is a mix. Uh, the, I like this uh, famous paper by Darren Akumokolo that you do a bit of subsidy. So you subsidize the new ones and you tax the old ones. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, to stimulate innovation. And innovation comes into the money is the, if the price difference becomes bigger. And that's a subsidy and tax. But uh, in addition, uh, I mentioned this Montreal uh, protocol for the for the ozone layer. Sometimes you need regulation, and like we are a big uh, debate in the Netherlands on agriculture. We put too much uh, nitrogen out on the land, and and the end game we know uh, we need uh, to get rid of one third of the cattle. You know, one way or another way, that will be uh, the final stage. And at some point you get some regulation and, uh, and probably the government because farmers are always protected, the government buying them out, but that's the end game. So if you are a company uh, providing uh, feed for uh, cattle, 
you, you can be sure that your uh, sales will be reduced by one third because the cattle will be reduced. That way of thinking, um, and the government can have different ways. And the final one I like is, uh, like Apple started also off with a subsidy when it was small. And sometimes you need, uh, if there is a huge uncertainty, uh, the government is a starting investor. We have a lot of regional investment companies. They often get it wrong, but sometimes right. They start off something which is not yet market uh, return, prove the concept, and then others can step in. So sometimes they, uh, what Mariana Mascato calls, they should be the launching uh, investor. Um, uh, you can do procurement. You can uh, the government do can can have procurement with very strict conditions. So to help out the new companies by buying their products. And so there are different sets, but only tax and subsidy is insufficient. So you need to do more than only the market than the, the market tools. Sometimes you have to take the lead in, in the real economy. That's a mix. Thank you very much. Well, we are out of time. We've had plenty of good questions and we've had a lot of good debate, I think, as well. Um, but yeah, our time is up. Uh, it won't be the last time that we run a webinar on this. I believe that they will be increasing in frequency over the next few years. So uh, you'll be seeing plenty of Patrick and Dirk, I hope. And uh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Dirk, for uh, great presentations. Thank, thank you to everyone. Th thank you, Tim. And I yeah. hope you won't see us often in the future. Oh, it's <laughs> no, we've enjoyed it. And uh, thanks to exactly. everyone. <laughs> thanks to everyone behind the scenes at uh, CFPR for putting this on, and Lise especially, who's been running things today. Uh, thank you for all of you for showing up and for asking questions. We hope you got what you want. Let us know if you did. Let us know if you didn't as well. And um, we'll do it better next time. But we hope you've had plenty to think about for this one. So, from me, Tim Phillips, till next time, goodbye. <laughs>